Hello everyone and welcome to Sandbox CDB Season 2. Due to significant changes in the program in version 1.0.5, including new aerodynamics, thermodynamics, and parts, the EDB realized that it would basically have to recertify all of its designs and that the more practical path would be to create a brand new set of designs instead. Our existing infrastructure is still in place though, starting with Hoffman Station, which you see here. It has docked to it the GB, which we're not sure right now whether that will be safe for re-entry. Uh, speaking of which, also the huge Orion 1 Space Liner, which is on the left-hand side in that view, uh, which we also are not sure is safe. And it also has a space tug there. That, that I think, is reasonably safe, but we're not sure whether the Space Liner or GB can return to the surface intact, and so that's part of our problem, much less recertifying the shuttle, which is another thing altogether. We also have a station around the moon. This is Bean Station, with its characteristic green glow. Currently, it's basically a crew facility and refueling station, and so uh, no additional functionality there, though obviously uh, much possibility for expansion. Around Minmus, we do have a mining station, and it has a miner docked to it right now, and so that is an uh, ore mining facility for refueling purposes. However, what we don't have is an uh, ore scanning satellite, which we need to deploy at our earliest convenience. But you can see that the refiner is there and the drilling unit is ready to go. So uh, with that, we turn to the mission for this episode, which is uh, quite, quite an amazing one, I think you'll agree. And it is the launch of the ED Prime, which is a new space plane, potentially a more robust uh, crew transport vehicle than the GB and uh, this seating two Kerbals and to test it out we have Kathina Kerman, a pilot and Albar Kerman, an engineer. So here we go, you can see it is powered by four rapiers, much heavier than GB not really in the same class but uh, its capabilities are somewhere between, it, well obviously somewhere between the GB and the Orion 1 Space Liner but the idea is that it can go to many different systems all on its own and refuel at those locations and you'll see the the unique things that were brought into the program in 1.0.5 coming to play in this. But here we go, its initial ascent pitch is 30 degrees. It has a fairly low um, takeoff speed at about uh, 70 meters per second, about 150 miles an hour. So that's pretty good. Uh, it has a huge wing area, you can see there, and that has multiple benefits, including reducing the liftoff speed and also producing an increased amount of drag when trying to re-enter. Once it gets to altitude, the pitch decreases, but that's not for a while, and that's when it uh, begins to attempt to break the sound barrier. Right now, it's simply trying to gain altitude as quickly as possible. You'll note that it has an ore tank that is currently empty. That should give you a hint as to its special capabilities. But here a magnificent view of it as it starts to moderate its pitch and gain velocity. So again, this design is known as the ED Prime, or just the Prime for short. And this mission is designated Prime 1. Uh, Kathina Kerman was the backup pilot for ETS-1 and ETS-2 was the commander of ETS-5 and ETS-8, those were the shuttle missions. Uh, Al Bart was the engineer on ETS-6 and ETS-8, and so has worked with Katina, Kathina Kerman before. The choice to use four rapiers instead of a mix of engines came after much testing, and the EDB decided that this was the ideal configuration for this particular design. And uh, we'll see it working out here as it gains a lot of velocity. The, Rapiers have a high peak thrust at uh, Mach 3.7, I believe, and so it is uh, plunging ahead to that peak thrust value right now and gaining, gaining velocity in excess of 1200 meters per second. The rapier should switch to closed cycle mode at around 24 kilometers. The vehicle has generous fuel margins, so even if the ideal velocities or pitch or trajectory are not met, uh, there is still plenty of room to get to orbit. And in fact, a few margins may be enough so that on an ideal trajectory, it could even launch itself to the moon, though probably not get into orbit around it. Here we go, in closed cycle mode, the pitch returns to, uh, it should be 30 degrees, 35 is excessive, and you'll note that uh, velocity is dropping off there, and so 
Athena really needs to bring that down to 30 degrees. And then after 30 kilometers, the pitch drops below 30 degrees to follow the prograde vector down. And here we see Kathena establishing an apoapsis of around 100 kilometers and then circularizing at apoapsis or close to apoapsis in preparation to rendezvous with Hoffman Station. And so this is destined to dock at the station and then refuel somewhat and then move on to Minmus is the target for this mission. And so here we go at uh, in a phasing orbit and after a day's wait in orbit it is able to rendezvous with the station. There's the rendezvous path. This is the rendezvous burn. There are plenty of important aspects to this docking with Hoppin Station, this uh, test of the ED Prime, but one of the main things that the EDB wanted to test was the placement of the RCS ports and whether they were well balanced because the RCS ports are placed so that they are not too exposed to the re-entry heat and so they're not placed on the bottom of the vehicle at all and given that the EDB has to make sure that they are placed properly so that docking can take place with relative efficiency. Uh, the vehicle does use a lot of mod propellant to approach the station as you see here and it's already through almost half of its mod propellant supply. It is a fairly heavy vehicle at this point and perhaps the EDB might want to consider adding more mod propellant to the vehicle, especially since the liquid fuel and oxidizer supplies are replete and so it can clearly take more cargo. From Kathina's point of view, the station was quite dark. The ED Prime does have lights that are next to the docking port that can shine on anything it's targeting for docking, but uh, right now those lights were not placed ideally and because of the dark, uh, Kathina nearly nearly hit the solar panels on the space tug and you can see her firing the RCS to avoid them with relative calm and uh, showing her professionalism there but uh, just narrowly avoiding a collision with that space tug there and that space tug actually brought that huge fuel tank to the station to add it as a major module to the station and that's why it's still docked there. It's not an integral par part of the station. Here further maneuvers towards the docking port. Now there's an interesting docking because the docking port is not ideal for this vehicle. It was never meant for this vehicle. The docking port that the ED Prime is aiming for was actually meant for the GBs. And so not, not the best place for it. And it'll have to tilt a little bit to make sure that its wingtip fins do not hit the structure of the station. Uh, here you see the approach, very slow and careful. To be sure, the ED Prime did not have any spare RCS in order to make a second attempt at docking should the first one fail. And so, and you can see the mop propellant load there. So, um, if it failed to dock, it would have to uh, pull away and and actually go ahead with re-entry instead of the rest of the mission. And so, one attempt only and that is why it was conducted with very great care and uh, here we go for the final approach to the dock you can see how the ED Prime is tilted with respect to the station to avoid hitting the main structure there and there you have it a successful docking Kathina and Albart now transferring fuel from the station to the ED Prime there's a nice view of now four vehicles Dock to the space station, Hoffman Station, three of them space planes. So quite a sight there. And now the undocking. There we go. The ED Prime has undocked and will now pull away from the station very cautiously indeed. And will start making its way to Minmus. So here you can see how slowly the process of pulling away was conducted and there is a trajectory to Minmus. You'll note that it requires a mid-course plane change there and so that will be conducted close to the orbit of the moon. Here again the space plane pulling away from the station. Very interesting views of the Orion 1 space liner there and then finally the trans Minmus injection burn. 
So in its small cargo bay, the ED Prime has a small ISRU refinery. It has two radial ore tanks and two fuel cells. And actually the fuel cells are running right now as we speak. It has no solar panels or RTGs. It is simply run with fuel cells. As we see that the trajectory to Minmus not entirely certain here. And uh, indeed the trajectory after the mid-course correction, very dubious indeed. But the mission proceeded anyway and the craft got to Minmus SOI. Uh, the drill is actually on the tail, uh, nestled between two of the rapiers, and we'll see that later on. Here is Mimus orbit insertion, and there we have it, uh, low periapsis, and then at periapsis, the ED Prime brought down its apoapsis into a tight orbit in preparation for landing. Because one other thing that the ED Prime has is four Rockamax 2477 thrusters. And those are aimed down to allow it to land veto style on low gravity objects, possibly the moon, but the moon is a little bit tight on the thrust to weight ratio. But uh, bodies like Gilly, like uh, Paul or Bop, and like Minmus, it can handle with relative ease. And so here is the descent burn. This conducted with the rapiers. And then a reorientation with landing gear out, as you can see. And perhaps you can spot the drilling unit on the tail there. Reorientation. And now it is controlling from the docking port again, instead of the cockpit. And with that change in orientation, the Rockmax 2477s go to work. Less efficient than the rapiers. But uh, in this case, not much delta V is required from them, so that is positive. Uh, initially, it looked like the craft was going to sit down on those rough slopes there. And so Kathina had to sort of sidestep, and you can see her sort of tilting away from them and trying to aim for the flatter, well, the flats, obviously. There you see the ISRU unit with its ore tanks and uh, batteries and fuel cells. And then on the tail here, there is the mining unit, the Drillomatic, fairly small. And of course, this small form factor is new to this version of the program, and that is why this is only possible in this version. And so now we can take advantage of the new small ISRU unit and small drilling unit and radial ore tanks to make a craft like this, which is now carefully setting itself down on the surface of Minmus shadow very prominent and you can see it's almost out of fuel very close to being out of fuel so it better be able to refuel here on Minmus otherwise it's going to be in significant trouble our Kerbals will have to be rescued Kathina, Kerman and Albart will be going home in in disgrace but there we have it and it has set down on Minmus. Uh, nose gear having a little bit of trouble settling down because of SAS being on perhaps. And now the drilling unit is deployed. And and ore extraction begins. And there is ore. Ore is successfully going into the tank. And it looks like operations will be able to proceed at this point. Radiator panels have been extended to facilitate cooling. Possibly more might have been necessary. We do have Albart on board, so Albart is helping out with these operations in his engineering capacity and increasing the efficiency of the process. But it is still going to take an enormous amount of time. There is no intention to completely fill up the tanks of the ED Prime. However, the goal is to certainly fill it up to the point where there's no doubt that the ED Prime has enough fuel to do whatever it might need to do to get back home safely and so Kathina Kerman and Alba Kerman are prepared for that. Uh, currently uh, T plus seven days and uh, they are destined to return on T plus 90 days. So conversion is proceeding, heat is being generated, ore is being extracted and converted and electric charge is going down a little bit faster than 
the EDB would have liked. And perhaps some change to the, the charge capacity will be in order for future missions, uh, perhaps more fuel cells, uh, and I'm sure the EDB will be taking a look at that. But here, preparing for launch on day 90 of the mission, radiator panels retracted, though still glowing red hot, and the Rock Max 40, uh, 2477s, the twitch engines, doing their job lifting off, even with the heavier load now. And uh, they will be able to lift this off the ground of Minmus, even with a maximum load. Reorientation, closing of the docking port, which is no longer used for control here. Control is back in the cockpit. Brakes retracted, and the firing of the rape beers. The rape beers with their great efficiency, getting the getting the ED prime to orbit. They're uh, establishing apoapsis, and then at apoapsis, the ED prime will circularize its orbit, finalizing the situation and preparing for the transfer back home. Now, with the inclination of Minmus, uh, the transfer back home is not where mission controllers would like, and so after doing this burn to get out of Minmus SOI, there will be a subsequent burn at Apoapsis, at Kerbin Apoapsis, in order to correct the inclination and also bring the periapsis down a bit to make sure that the ED prime will hit the atmosphere and be able to use the atmosphere to slow down. And that's probably the diciest part of the business, as you might imagine. So here is the, the correction burn in Kerbin SOI at Apoapsis, correcting the inclination as much as possible from that point, and that reduces the inclination to 7.1 degrees, and the periapsis is set to 42 kilometers. Mission controllers later conceded that uh, 42 kilometers was actually just a lucky guess. Uh, barely lucky, in fact, as we will soon see. Here is the approach to the Kerbin, and approaching on the nighttime side. And as the vehicle slammed into the atmosphere, even high up, you can see the cockpit getting dangerously hot, glowing red there. Very disconcerting. And as the vehicle got lower, uh, there was a definite overheating indicator and that led Kathina Kerman to extend the radiator pan panels in the hope that that would dissipate some heat. And you can see also heat being generated on the air brakes, though not as much as is present on the cockpit, which is very close at this point to uh, total destruction there. But... The periapsis was 42 kilometers, and with the cockpit very close to its temperature limit, the vehicle started going up actually at uh, around 44 kilometers because the E prime had been generating lift, and so the periapsis was also being lifted up during that time. And with its nose very high up, it managed to survive this aero braking, and we'll take a look at what orbit it actually ends up at here with the flames receding. Checking its orbit, we see that its apoapsis was around 140 to 150 kilometers, which is excellent, of course, and that means that any lower than that, and this vehicle would have had quite a bit of trouble. So it would have been uh, going directly down, probably heating too much to survive. This is an uh, inclination correction burn to ensure that uh, we get rid of the additional 7.1 degrees that we couldn't correct at uh, high apoapsis. And so the inclination is corrected and it is now in a stable orbit around 100 kilometers. Actually a periapsis of 96 kilometers I believe. And then at the, well actually a little bit past the standard retro burn point, uh, Kathina brought the periapsis down to 28.9 kilometers it looks like. And because it wasn't directly over the eastern peninsula there, uh, that led the vehicle to be a little bit past the ideal trajectory for hitting the KSC again. And so this is overshooting right now. Kathina tried to keep the nose up quite sharply in order to gain as much drag as possible to prevent overshooting by too much. Of course, there's plenty of fuel uh, if uh, she needs to turn around there. That is not the problem. It is simply a matter of uh, 
well, elegance, if you will, getting the trajectory as close as possible. And here you see the situation as the western mountains are crossed, and Kathina begins to try and turn the ED Prime around towards the KSC again. Engines were lit as the velocity was getting a little bit too low, and then, and then the Kraken struck. Now, the EDB was not sure whether this particular Kraken still existed in 1.0.5, but it certainly does. And this is the first test of that, and very decisive it is. Our error logs show that these parts collided with the launch pad, and so this bug still exists pretty definitively. Fortunately, the EDB is not at its full load, and it always had more wing surface than it strictly required, and so the excess wing surface allowed it to remain stable despite the loss of those pieces. Now, for those wishing to avoid this particular Kraken, uh, we can give the advice that you should restart the program between launching and re-entry. Uh, so once the space plane has gotten into space, restart the program and that should allow you to avoid the Kraken. Uh, unfortunately, this was all done at one go, and you can see the Kraken continuing to strike. Uh, at this point, it is not endangering the vehicle uh, completely, but soon we'll see, as the vehicle continues to approach the runway, a very disconcerting... Um, well, we're not entirely sure how to describe it, and we don't know what caused it. You can see uh, massive instability in the craft, and that seems to be a different Kraken. We are not sure whether that is the same Kraken. And so unfortunately on the first test of DD Prime, the vehicle was destroyed, except for the cockpit. And Kathina Kerman and Albach Kerman survived. On the whole, the EDB considers the overall test of the system to be a success. Uh, this system has gone through landing tests before, so it can land after re-entry. And uh, so since it survived re-entry, uh, the test overall was a success as long as EDB discovers consistent ways to avoid the Kraken in the future. And it looks like the Kraken is still present, and perhaps there is a different Kraken that the EDB will have to find countermeasures measures for. But for now, we are grateful to have Kathina and Albart back, and we hope to enjoy many of their future adventures. And with that, we'll say thank you for watching this first presentation of Season 2 of Sandbox EDB. And if you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And we'll see you next time.